From Wondery, I'm Mark Ramsey, and this is part two of Inside Psycho. There's an old fable that speaks to the soul of everyone who chooses the struggling, solitary life of a writer. A gaunt wolf was almost dead with hunger when he met a house dog who was passing by. Ah, cousin, said the dog, look at you. Your irregular life will be the ruin of you. Why do you not work steadily as I do? and get your food regularly given to you. I would love that, said the wolf. But where? Follow me, said the dog. Come with me to my master and you shall share my work. So the wolf and the dog went towards the town together. On the way, the wolf noticed that the hair around the dog's neck was worn away. How did that happen? asked the wolf. Oh, it is nothing, said the dog. That is only the place where the collar is put on at night to keep me chained up. It chafes a bit, but one soon gets used to it. Is that all? said the wolf. Then goodbye to you, Master Dog. When he was a kid... Robert Block devoured every issue of a fantasy and horror fiction magazine called Weird Tales. One of the leading writers for that magazine was horror legend H.P. Lovecraft. What was it about Lovecraft that captured Block's imagination? Was it the sense that the ordinary all around us masked something dark and dangerous, something evil? As a teenager... Block struck up a correspondence with Lovecraft who encouraged him to submit his own writings to Weird Tales. Would you like to write some stories, Lovecraft wrote? I'd be glad to comment on them. How could he refuse? Over time, the relationship grew. Lovecraft even wrote Block into a story and killed him. Block reciprocated, of course. There is no greater tribute to someone you respect than to murder them in cold blood. In 1953, Block gave up a promising career as an ad copywriter to devote himself full-time to spinning original tales of thrills and chills. By 1957, he had moved from Milwaukee to Weawega, Wisconsin. He pounded away at his typewriter day after long day, one freelance tall tale after another. It was in his study, at his typewriter, that he heard the first inkling about what the papers called the Butcher of Plainfield. Now remember, this was the late 50s. Some news wasn't fit to print. These were the happy days of the Fonz and Richie Cunningham. Ozzy and Harriet glowed from every TV. Father always knew best, and the music charts were topped by the likes of Paul Anka and Pat Boone. Even America's favorite married couple, Lucy and Desi, didn't share the same bed. There were things good folks, upright folks, just did not discuss. So only the barest outlines of the Ed Gein horrors made their way past gossip and into the headlines of newspapers near and far. Still, these thin headlines gave Robert Block an idea. When Block immersed himself in a story, there was no interrupting him. He wrote and wrote, days, weeks. Until finally, the last word of the final page. He would call it Psycho. It was the story of a lonely, fat, middle-aged booze hound who had an unnatural attachment to his mother. He killed her and stuffed her corpse. He runs a rundown roadside motel. 
One rainy night, a young woman arrives, checks her in, spies on her through a peephole as she prepares for a shower. The lonely man, dressed grotesquely as his mother, kills the young woman in the shower, cutting off her head. The scraps of headlines Block had gathered about Ed Gein had been transformed into the three-dimensional character of Norman Bates. Robert Block is at his bathroom mirror shaving. As time passed, Block learned more about the handiwork of Ed Gein, the serial murderer of the Wisconsin heartland. And what he learned unsettled him. See, Norman Bates was written as a cross-dresser who puts on the dress and wig of his mother to commit heinous crimes. Block didn't know that Ed Gein dressed up too. He didn't know about Gein's fixation on his mother or that he treated her bedroom as a shrine. And yet, these elements emerged from his own imagination in the construction of Norman Bates. He stared at himself in the mirror. How could he know? In creating a fictional character, he had come closer to the truth than he ever could have imagined. What had he revealed inside his own soul? He closed his eyes. For the next two years, he could not look at himself in the mirror without seeing the specter of Ed Gein staring back. It's Block's agent on the phone. Hello? He has good news. Really? <laughs> That's great. That is great. What's the price? Uh, but is, is that a good price? Should we take it? Okay. All right, let's do it. And with that, the deal was done. For the first time, Robert Block's writing had been optioned for the movies. But who was the buyer? Oh, who cares? The blind bid was $9,000. That's more than $74,000 today. For a writer, that's a payday. What Robert Block didn't know is that another novel, The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, was also optioned that year. It would be renamed The Haunting and directed by Robert Wise in 1963. The rights went for $67,500. More than seven times what Block would be paid almost $600,000 today. Block was in a mood to celebrate. As he popped the champagne, he knew none of this. He didn't even know who the buyer was. At that bargain price, it literally could have been anyone. But it was not anyone. It was one of the most famous directors in Hollywood. And that director had just acquired the rights to what would become the most important film of his career for next to nothing. Eventually, of course, Block would find out, and he would always, always resent it. His deal with the publisher included no points on any sale to Hollywood. In the end, the publisher and his agent took 25% off the top. After taxes, Block figured he wound up with about $5,000. And that's when he learned that the buyer was Alfred Hitchcock. April 29, 1980, Bel Air. Midnight, the witching hour. Alfred Hitchcock can't sleep. He's in bed, but he, but he can't get comfortable. Hitchcock could never seem to get comfortable anymore. Maybe the television would capture his interest. Back and forth he went between the same channels, and then he stopped. This movie on the Late Late Show, this one he knew. It was his movie. The one he bet everything on. The one they told him not to make. The quick and cheap shocker 
everybody underestimated. The one that made him rich. The one that changed movies. The one for which he would forever be linked and forever be famous. He was watching Psycho. The memories washed over him. He had to cry. He was 80 years old now and suffering a host of serious ailments, hypertension, heart condition, kidney troubles. All his life, he loved food and drink. Now he refused both. Rarely did he leave bed. Even rarer did he see or talk to friends. Hitchcock was alone. Almost. There was still Alma. Always Alma. Dear Alma. She had been by his side, his partner in work and in life, for almost 60 years. She was beside him now in his bed and in his heart. With the dawn came the morning. That was when his kidneys failed and that heart stopped. Alfred Hitchcock, the master of suspense, was gone. London, 1904. Six-year-old Alfred Hitchcock was on an errand. His father had handed him a note. Deliver this to the officer on duty, he told the boy. Hitchcock always did as he was told. And so he handed the note to the officer. Come with me, boy. He was being led into an open cell. This is what we do to bad little boys. Many years later, somebody asked Hitchcock what message he'd like inscribed on his tombstone. This is what we do to bad little boys, he said. That was most likely a joke, if it was a true story at all. Because Alfred Hitchcock's working-class Cockney upbringing was many things, but not the stuff of Dickens. At family gatherings, I would sit quietly in a corner saying nothing. I looked and observed a great deal. I've always been that way, he said. He was, always, an outsider. An observer of the ribbon of life who would one day spool those ribbons onto film reels and share them with the world. I was very quiet, very dignified. I kept to myself, he said. Hitch was a chubby boy with soft brown eyes. At St. Ignatius Catholic School, he would sit on a stone bench and watch the other children play. From the beginning, an outsider, watching, always watching. Before there was Psycho, there were 46 previous Alfred Hitchcock films, an amazingly prolific output then and now. What was it like working with Hitchcock on a major motion picture? It was serious business. That's what one actor, Paul Jasmine, on set for Psycho told me. Every male member of the crew wore a shirt and a tie. Hitchcock knew exactly what he wanted in advance, and he was determined to get it. He was a master storyteller and a technical genius with as much know-how as any specialist on any set. But what was the man like? That's what I asked Jasmine. Well, I never met him, he told me. But I saw him work, and he was all business. The assistant director would say, Mr. Hitchcock wants you to do this. Mr. Hitchcock wants you to do that. I never spoke with him. He was famous for not really talking to his actors. Nobody spoke on the set. You could hear a pin drop. He spoke to no one, of course, unless you were the star. When an actress asked Hitchcock if her right or left profile was better, he told her, my dear, you're sitting on your best profile. Another story. An actor was having trouble with his character. It wasn't making sense to him. What's my motivation, he asked. Your salary, Hitch replied. 
1944, Hitchcock made a unique wartime motion picture. A passenger ship is torpedoed by a Nazi U-boat, and 10 survivors make their way to a lifeboat. The entire movie takes place on that lifeboat, tossed about for three months of production in surf, simulated by wave-making machines. The biggest star in the movie was snobbish grand dame Tallulah Bankhead, a prima donna playing the part of a prima donna, according to Hitchcock biographer Patrick McGilligan. She was a lot to handle in no small part because she was not fond of wearing underwear, ever. Now, as you can imagine, on such a tiny set and in one skirt for the entire shoot, this caused problems. One day, a cameraman threw up his arms in frustration and despair. Every time Tallulah spreads her legs, she ruins the shot, he told Hitchcock. Hitch pondered this for a moment, and then he responded loud enough for all to hear. Shall I call wardrobe, makeup, or hairdressing? Hitchcock was a notorious prankster. When meeting someone new, it went like this. Good evening, Mr. Hitchcock. Call me Hitch, without the cock. During the making of The Birds, Hitchcock had a gift for star Tippi Hedren's daughter, five-year-old Melanie Griffith. It was a doll that was a dead ringer for her mother in a gift box shaped like a coffin. Spring 1959, a production suite on the Paramount Pictures lot in Hollywood. Alfred Hitchcock is smoking a handmade Cuban cigar, his favorite. He's about to turn 60. By now, everyone knew the name Hitchcock. He was Hollywood's original king of the world. He had made dozens of films. He was three seasons deep on a successful TV series, Alfred Hitchcock Presents... He had full creative control over every aspect of his movies now. He could literally do whatever he wanted to do. As Hitch rolled the cigar between his fingers, he thought, is this all there is? Isn't it only when you can do anything that your mind goes to doing the one thing you haven't done yet? But what? North by Northwest was about to be released. Vertigo was ready to shoot. Hitch was without question at his creative peak. And nothing creates pressure like a creative peak. His office reviewed 2,400 submissions that year, 2,400 ideas for what's next. Operatic masterpieces, big and expensive blockbuster set pieces, been there, done that. That's what Hitchcock thought. How can I surprise them all? We've got to outwit the audience to keep them with us. Time was not standing still. There were Hitchcock wannabes, like shockmeister William Castle nipping at his heels. There were the egos and the salary demands of big-name stars. There was the impressive box office from low-budget newcomer production houses like Universal International and Hammer Films. Over in Europe, the French New Wave filmmakers were introducing gritty reality and adult themes. These were exploding onto the big screen, and audiences were responding. Audiences were changing. Hitchcock would quiz his limousine driver. How much money do you think a first-class, low-budget shocker could make if it was made by a really great director. Not that I'm thinking about any great director in particular. Back on the lot, he held one particular submission close in his hands. He smiled that devious, dark smile of his. This one couldn't be farther from the tuxedoed sophistication of Cary Grant or the autumnal yearnings of Jimmy Stewart, the American everyman. Hitch could do anything he wanted, so surely he could do this. As long as the suits at Paramount don't hate it, 
Because if they do, then Hitch will have to risk everything to make this movie a reality. Next time on Inside Psycho. From Wondery, this is a six-part deep dive inspired by the story behind an unforgettable classic movie. This is part two of Inside Psycho. We'd like to learn more about you. Please complete a short survey at wondery.com slash survey and subscribe to this show on iTunes, Stitcher, the Wondery app on Android, or wherever you listen. It's free. For more information and to comment on this show, visit our website, wondery.com slash inside psycho. If you like the show, we'd love you to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps others go inside psycho too. Written and narrated by Mark Ramsey. Sound design and editing by Jeff Schmidt. Produced by Mark Ramsey Media. Executive producers Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. Please thank us by rewarding our sponsors with your support. Tell your friends about this show. And mother, thanks you. Thanks you.